Ever wonder what happens when karma shows up in Hell's Kitchen? Stick around, because we're about to uncover the most epic moments where karma hits chefs harder than Gordon's critiques. Just like this contestant from season 4, who thought keeping an entire list of orders on hold would somehow help her teammates get their act together. Now, I have no idea what she was expecting, but what it resulted in was a whole bunch of diners who were left waiting for hours on end. What happened is, Roseanne Fama was put on duty as an assistant maitre d' in the second episode. Just as the service kicked off, Roseanne was taking her sweet time with the first set of orders. It looked like forever before the orders made it to Ramsey's hands in the kitchen. Meet some orders. He's gonna explode. He's gonna explode in two seconds. Oh my god. Seeing this, JP was worried that Ramsey would blow his top even before the chefs had turned on their burners. And what do you know, Roseanne took a whole 37 minutes until she finally rolled in with her first ticket. 37 minutes in, nothing in the ladies. Okay. Move your ass. Yes, sir. Ramsey couldn't understand the reason behind her laid back attitude. He made sure to give her a quick lesson on urgency and commanded her to hustle. Well, any other contestant would have taken his words seriously. I mean, it's not every day that Ramsey lets you go with just a warning. However, two hours into the madness, Roseanne kicked herself into overdrive. She finally decided to hand Ramsey a ticket she'd scribbled down more than an hour ago. And what was her excuse? Well, take a look at this. I have a line of tickets waiting up for you, and I don't want to bombard you all at once and give them to you. Yeah. That was her justification. Rosanna had held onto a bunch of tickets only because she didn't want to overwhelm Ramsey. Oh, how considerate of her. Well, Ramsey's reaction should be enough to tell you what he thought about that little idea. What? Yeah, sure. Everything you touched, you the man was confused as hell. I mean, what the hell was she even talking about? It's crazy to think that you've already placed your order and it hasn't made its way into the kitchen yet after two hours had crawled by. Quite expectedly, the red team crashed and burned that service. Not surprising why Roseanne was at her wit's end during the deliberations. She was pretty sure her days were numbered. But despite that, she tried to maintain a positive attitude. Still, she was 100% responsible for the sluggish pace the red team ran at that night. Which is why it was pretty shocking when she managed to dodge the bullet that was elimination that night. Girl got lucky, let me tell ya. Unlike this next guy who is facing down the barrel of elimination. Let's dive into the mess that is Anton Testino from season 12. And well, it's safe to say that this dude didn't exactly win hearts and minds during his time on the show. Especially during one of those chaotic dinner services, when Scott was in charge of handling the meat station. But guess what? He choked big time. As the orders piled up one after another, Scott was struggling to keep up the pace. And that's when Anton entered the picture. He walked up to Scott, trying to be this Mr. Nice Guy who was willing to offer help with the appetizers. And well, Scott agreed much to Anton's shock. Every time I try to help the kid, he tells me no, but he just asked for help. Maybe he's learning how good I am. So I mean, why offer help in the first place? Now, this is a rare moment because they usually couldn't stand each other, but Scott wasn't exactly at his best. He ended up firing a whole batch of scallops instead of just one. Do I have to do everything? Get the scallops off of there. What a mess. However, as the night rolled on, Anton's performance took a nosedive. The red team's diners were getting hungry, and Anton continued to lose his marbles. First, he screwed up the Wellingtons and blamed it on the oven. Yeah, right. Like, that's even a valid excuse. Let's watch the disaster unfold together, shall we? Obviously, I screwed it up with the oven. Next door's oven, I got it down pat. This one, I screwed it up. Right. And oh boy, it only got worse from there. He disrespected sous chef Andy and had the nerve to play the gender card, thinking he didn't need her guidance just because she's a woman. Yeah, no, this dude crossed the line. Can someone shut him up, please? Don't you ever talk back to me! Yes, you are! Pull it together! You I'm not talking back to anybody! By this point, Ramsey had enough of Anton's BS and called him out for dragging the whole team down. What the fuck are you doing? 
You've got to keep it together. And what was Anton's excuse? He was back to whining about the ovens in the red kitchen being different somehow from the ones in the blue kitchen. Well, thankfully, Ramsey had the presence of mind to shut that little rant of his down real quick. What's more, Melanie also joined in and straight up told him not to blame the oven for his lousy performance. Yeah, truth hurts. Come on, get it back in the oven, yes, in the up. pan, braise it, let's go, pink. Anyway, I think Joy and Kashia were on point when they nominated him for elimination. And what did he do? He had the nerve to nominate Kashia in return. Well, that's not how the show works, bro. You need to vote for the weakest performer, which, let me remind you, was you. Regardless, when the time came for him to beg for his life, he had the audacity to claim Ramsey should know better than to kick him out, thanks to his hidden talents. Well, a few moments later, Ramsey gave him the boot. Ramsey must have been tired of waiting for him to put those hidden skills of his into practice. Anton made some bold claims in his exit interview, saying he was the best, and also added that he would open a restaurant right next to Ramsey's just to spite him. However, Ramsey nailed it when he fired back, saying Anton let his small successes in Hell's Kitchen blow up his ego. It's time to deflate that balloon. Hey, Anton. How's that restaurant of yours going? Now, Anton definitely tried to play dirty, but here comes a contestant who came up with a scheme to nominate not one, but two good chefs. But would Ramsey accept the decision? Let's find out. What kitchen you're in tonight, but from where I was standing, you have the wrong two. So in episode three of season 19, the red team lost the dinner service and had to nominate two members for elimination. That's when Cyan dropped a bombshell by calling out Lauren and Nikki. However, Ramsey was legitimately shook by Nikki's nomination. What did she do wrong tonight? Nothing, Chef. I thought she was great. And all that Cyan could say to justify it was that Nikki may not be able to cut it as a top chef down the road. In the long run, she wasn't going to be strong enough. So, like, seriously. Is that even a legit reason? Well, Ramsey wasn't blind to such deception. He could clearly see through her little plot, clear as day. Instead of playing fair, Cyan wanted to cull the strong so she'd have an easier time picking off the weak on her own. But again, Hell's Kitchen isn't all about survival of the fittest. Like, they have a whole show for that. It's called Survivor. No, HK is all about the skill and leadership and more importantly, the determination to play a fair game. Well, of course, Ramsey gives all contestants an opportunity to pick the weakest. But when they fail to do so, he makes sure to call them out. Not based on tonight's performance that got you kicked out. Like, did they forget that their customers were left hungry? Ramsey did not mince his words when he said this. Rare, it's fucking quacking, and that's the shit you serve. Meanwhile, Nikki wasn't having it and thought it was a totally unfair call. But when Cyan jumped in to defend herself, Ramsey had to pull the plug. It was time to take things seriously. When I ask you to give me two nominees, I expect you to take this seriously. In a shocking twist, Ramsey called two contestants out for elimination on his own. Wondering who? Well, see for yourselves. Jordan, you know it. Fabiola, you know it. Step forward. Yeah, he did it himself, calling out the two who were actually responsible for the Red Kitchen screw-ups that night. And finally, Ramsey gave Jordan the pass and Fabiola the boot. For one, Fabiola's appetizers were a flop. But there was a more concerning issue at play. Her health was taking a nosedive. Fabiola had a mix of remorse for how she messed up, balanced with some real serious health concerns. She even had to kneel with a medic there. Tough break. Hope you're feeling better, Fabiola. But this next contestant treated food like it was trash. Seriously, it's mind-boggling how Keith Green from season two managed to stumble into third place with his so-called incredible skills. So on the third dinner service, Keith was holding down the appetizer station. Ramsey gave him a heads up not to screw up the risotto. Surprisingly, he didn't mess up any of those, but pulled off something so cringeworthy that it left even the customers dumbfounded. Now, every chef has got to taste their food before it goes out. Keith was no different. So far, so normal. But oh boy, what he did next is beyond belief. Yep. 
Yep, he used a spoon to taste the dish, which seems normal, but then he used that very same spoon to plop the food onto the plate. Like, I shouldn't need to tell you how gross that is. But wait, there's more. Keith turned it up to 11 by grabbing fistfuls of rice for the risotto with his bare hands and just chucked it into the dish. And guess what? All this was going down while hungry customers were just staring at him. Slackjawed. Ramsey, trying his hardest to keep his cool, gave Keith some much needed advice on respecting food. Keith over here had apparently forgotten the basics of kitchen hygiene, and as if that wasn't enough, Ramsey noticed Keith's pants were so loose they were practically sliding off his butt. Damn. I'm losing count of how many ways this guy was oblivious. As Keith was trying to fix his pants, you could practically hear the customers praying that he wasn't the one preparing their orders. And amidst all the chaos Keith was probably unknowingly creating, everyone got distracted. And well, you have to see it to believe it. Gotta say, at least someone was relaxed amidst the chaos. So, now that none of us ever want to eat food again, this next contestant thought they could cheat without getting caught, but Ramsey didn't hesitate to give her a piece of his mind. In the sixth episode of season nine, things got heated during prep time. Carrie was all frustrated, because for some reason, no one seemed to be taking their job seriously. But guess what? Elise further added fuel to the fire when she accused Carrie of basically trying to make them all look like they didn't give a damn. And boom, that very instant, a huge argument broke out between the two. Elise, can I you please talk for one? I just don't like how you try to act like no one else around you is taking it serious. Woo, jolly cooperation. Anyway, let's head into the dinner service. Carrie was holding down the fort at the appetizer station with Jennifer, and it looks like she held on to that sourness from the argument earlier, cause this time, she sent up her salads even though Krupa wasn't ready with her pot stickers. And let me tell you this, Ramsey wasn't amused. Oh, off of here. here you go. As far as I'm concerned, you can off. Start again. Yes, yes. He handed her back the salads and hit the reset button, ordering the red team to start the whole ticket from scratch. Later, Carrie tried to make up for it and lent Krupa a hand on garnish duty, but this is where she goofed up. Carrie is hoping to impress Chef Ramsay with her speed. I have no idea why she thought it was okay to dump a whole lot of fresh rice onto a plate that already had a bunch of old rice left on it. Ramsey couldn't even believe his eyes. Gary, look at me, look at me! Are you adding the old rice into the fresh rice as we're eating it? I'm watching okay. whatever you're doing. Yeah. Well, Kerry was clearly trying to cut corners, but that's not how it works in Ramsey's kitchen. He literally schooled her and trashed the entire pan of rice. Talk about a slip up. But hey, Things somehow turned around for the better. The red team ended up winning the service after managing to nail both the team's orders. Carrie was feeling pretty good about it, especially after finding out the blue team got the boot. Eh, I guess you win this round, Carrie. Well, at least things worked out in her favor. Unlike this next contestant, who totally brushed off Ramsey's direction and decided to do her own thing. But when Ramsey caught wind of it, things went from zero to hysterical real quick. You know how challenges involving eggs are always exciting, right? Uh, well, anyway, season seven's egg relay challenge was no different. The goal was to cook up four egg dishes, poached, soft boiled, sunny side up, and scrambled. Sounds like a walk in the park, right? But here's the twist. It was all about testing if the chefs could handle the heat and cook something as basic as eggs without stumbling. Now, the red team was one member short, and since it was a paired challenge, Siobhan Allgood was left to handle all the eggs on her own. How tough could that be? Turns out, it's way more difficult than you could imagine. The teams had a measly five minutes to cook the eggs to perfection. But oh boy, Siobhan started freaking out because she was flying solo. I'm a little nervous about being on my own, but I'm gonna kick butt whether I'm by myself or with other people. And then she made the mother of all mistakes when she decided to team up with Autumn Lewis and Fran Clyer without Ramsey's permission. Siobhan, work with me and Fran, all no right? No problem. 
Now, whether it was because she was under pressure or not, Siobhan had just thrown Ramsey's instructions right out the window, and Autumn ended up getting her hands on the sunny side up. Oh. Siobhan, I got your sunny side up. And you do scramble. When it was time for the judgment, Ramsey threw her a curveball and asked how long she had boiled the soft boiled egg for. And what was her answer? You won't believe what she said. My teammates helped me, chef. Your teammates helped you. I asked you to work on your own. And Ramsey's face says it all. He was like, are you serious? But wait, it gets even worse. Siobhan's explanation pushed all of Ramsey's buttons. Like, what pressure was she even talking about? Truth is, Ramsey would have actually given her dish a pass. Well, obviously, he knew she was working all by herself. But Siobhan left him stunned when she started blaming her teammates for her actions. Because there was pressure from my team. Are you serious? From, from, not from my team, from Autumn. Okay, I don't remember anyone forcing her to do anything. Autumn just threw out an idea, and Siobhan went with it. So it's totally on her. Anyway, when she realized things were crumbling down around her, she decided to break down. I'm so mad. I shouldn't have listened to the teammates that were forcing me to do something that I should have known was wrong to do. Like, come on, as if crying is going to make anything better. But guess what? It wasn't just Siobhan. Autumn and Fran also pulled the same stunt by throwing Siobhan's help under the bus. Who poached this egg? I poached that oh, egg, Oh, Jesus. One point. Fuck off, will you? And that's even worse than what Siobhan did. Well, guess this challenge wasn't all that egg-sighting after all, right? Uh, but in this next episode, you'll see how these contestants tried to cheat and sabotage each other at the same time. Let's dive into the chaos of Episode 3, Season 12. Mike Aresta was working at the fish station with Chris, but hold on, because this is when things got wild. Mike straight up told Chris to drop the scallops when it wasn't time yet. And well, Chris was obviously pretty confused. No, not on this one. It's a fucking risotto. Now you confuse me. Was this part of Mike's devious plan to throw Chris under the bus for making a mistake? Well, it sure looks like it. And Chris, still confused as hell, called out Mike for acting like a complete idiot. Fast forward a bit, and Chris warned Mike about a super hot pan, but not before actually asking him to stay away from his station. You want me to watch these? No, no, no. I got you, Chris. He doesn't want any help. And this is when the real fun began. When Ramsey called out for the next dish, Mike brought this uncrusted halibut to the pass, something Chris had totally forgotten about. I'm behind you. Hey, 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 hey. Halibut. Although Chris tried to stop him, Mike was determined to have his way. And, well, his plan to sabotage Chris finally worked its magic. Where's yes, the crust? I, I didn't get no, it. You get it all, man! Yes, chef. But Mike wasn't done yet. He walked up with another halibut, and this time, he had his eyes on DeMarco. You see, DeMarco had forgotten to leave the bone in his chicken, which meant it needed a refire. I'm not sending one more fucking table out unless it's complete. Ramsey couldn't understand why the team's cooperation was going so poorly. Despite the warning, Scott ran out of patience and walked his lamb to the pass, not wanting to wait for the halibut. <clears throat> and that was the end of it. That one mistake got the entire blue team kicked out of the kitchen. Fuck up out of there. Get out. It was like everyone was trying to cheat to get ahead and send their dish out to the pass before anyone else had a chance to. There was no communication, no teamwork whatsoever, just full-blown aggro and sabotage. But that's nothing compared to the hard lessons that Jeremy Madden had to learn during his time in the kitchen. Remember when Jeremy's infamous lack of communication made Ramsey completely lose his mind? Jeremy, hey, hey, he's not even answering me. Come on, Jeremy. Can I get an answer from you? First off, the guy couldn't even hear the order. And when Ramsey confronted him about it, Jeremy straight up admitted he had no clue. I mean, seriously, the balls the guy must have had to just brush Ramsey off like that. But that wasn't the only time. Remember the croissant debacle? Jeremy decided to stand there like a statue, doing absolutely nothing. It was like he had a full-blown factory reset. Just look at him in action. Or, well, more aptly, in action. Jeremy, in the middle of the air like that with breakfast. Jeremy, what? Come around then, big boy. Ramsey was probably just as puzzled as I was when I saw this for the first time. And still am, watching it all over again. 
Minutes later, Jeremy finally brought up the croissant to the pass. But wait, looks like something's missing. So where's the smoked salmon scrambled eggs? Get smoked over there and help play the smoked salmon. Oh, right, the smoked salmon. You know, like half the dish? After his grand standstill performance, Jeremy suddenly got a second wind and tried to finish up everything at once. Come on! Watch your back, watch your back. Come on, come down. Then came the moment of truth. All the plates were lined up for the pass. And guess what caught Ramsey's eye? You guessed it, Jeremy's plate. And this wasn't just any plate. It was a freaking sample. Some disgusting pig brought me the sample scrambled eggs that I cooked an hour ago. Can you believe the level of stupidity going on here? Well, Ramsey sure didn't, since he was in utter disbelief and proceeded to give Jeremy a piece of his mind. Yes, they save lives on a daily basis, and you want to serve that. You fucking kill someone with that! Well, considering the dude may as well have been sleeping, he definitely needed the wake-up call. Now, sometimes, contestants go to any lengths necessary to steal the win. But can you believe that this next contestant actually bribed her teammates to help her win? I'm not even joking. So this went down during the final dinner service of season two, where Keith Green was one of the six chefs to make a comeback. He was Virginia's top choice for her team, even before Tom and Giacomo making him the overall first pick. First person I pick is you, Keith. However, he wasn't too thrilled about being on Virginia's team. Rather be on Heather's team because Virginia doesn't deserve it. Virginia demanded nothing but perfection. However, Keith had other plans. He actually wanted something in return for his hard work. Whoa. That was bold of him to ask. Well, he knew it wouldn't fire back at him in any way possible, because he was just there as a helper, and cheating won't get him in trouble. Can't get kicked out if you've already been kicked out, right? Which is why, despite Virginia's initial hesitation, he pressed for an immediate offer. Eventually, she gave in and pledged to reward the men if she ended up winning the competition. I'll give you each $1,000. You think that's fair? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Meanwhile, when the service came to an end, Keith made it clear that his main motivation was the $1,000 that Virginia had promised. As fate would have it, Virginia ended up losing to Heather in the finals, meaning Keith's hope for the money went unfulfilled. You know, sometimes you bet it all on black, and it comes up red. Tough luck, dude. But this next contestant made a grave mistake that could have potentially affected his personal life. This is where I wrote my boo. Mm -hmm. Off there. Sorry. My name's Squish. You're only on next time. In season 16, episode 7, things took a romantic turn in the dorms. Andrew Pierce and Heather decided to get cozy and cuddle up together. Thanks. You Can what? Push these things down. Can we take the bra off? But here's the kicker. Andrew made it crystal clear that he and Heather were just friends. Me and Heather are friends. You know, we're out here enjoying the moment, and she's a good girl. So hey, am I going to flirt with her a little bit? Maybe. However, even with his wedding a short few months away, Andrew didn't mind keeping the flirtatious vibe going. I get married in a couple months, so it's probably not going to be a strong relationship. Huh? Oh, not right now. Talk about a showmance, but let's address the elephant in the room. But get ready, because what went down in this next episode was totally unexpected. Michelle was assigned to the meat station while Manda was in charge of preparing the pasta dishes. For those of you who didn't know, Manda has celiac disease, so she couldn't taste the pasta herself. And so she went for the next best thing and asked Michelle for her opinion instead. Michelle tasted Manda's pasta and nodded in approval, saying it was good. Taste that for me. Is that done? Mm. 30 more seconds, okay. So far, so normal. Right? However, unknown to Manda, Michelle had ulterior motives. Ramsey tasted it, and well, what do you know? The first batch of pasta returned to the kitchen undercooked. It looks like a lot, chef. It's a no, just is taste raw. it. Just the taste it. Is raw. It's crunchy as. Manda was puzzled because she trusted Michelle's judgment. Michelle, on the other hand... I can tell when pasta's done just by looking at it, so Manda should be able to do it too. So were you blind while checking Manda's dish? Or, uh, what do you call not being able to taste? Anyway, Manda made a second attempt in hopes of getting it right this time. 
But as if she learned absolutely nothing, she sought Michelle's opinion again. Michelle, in turn, claimed the pasta was fine, again. I need a mouth. Here, Michelle. It's done. Michelle says the is done. But thanks to Elise, it was revealed that the pasta was still raw. And you wouldn't believe how nonchalant Michelle was about the whole thing. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. My bad. The first time I could excuse as an honest mistake. But twice? Nah, I don't think so. And she was so unapologetic about it. Michelle was fooling no one. Viewers saw right through it. And Manda also realized that she was being misled. Good job. Me twice now. Well, at least she didn't go in for a third round of punishment. But this next contestant exposed herself for the conniving, self-absorbed prick that she was during her run on the show. Witnessing Heather's struggle on the appetizer station in the third service brought a wicked gleam to Sarah's eye. Some kind of perverse, sadistic pleasure. She didn't just observe. She took pleasure in Heather's challenges, making a snide comment about the risotto too. I couldn't have graduated culinary school without making risotto. It's not my first rodeo. <laughs> in the fourth service, she was even more conniving. Tasked with the fish station, she forewent all pretenses of teamwork. Uh, Sarah, are we ready, yes? Yeah, I was waiting for her call, Steph. Called it three times. Her lack of communication with Rachel, despite repeated calls, disrupted the whole kitchen's flow. Yet, the extent of her deceit went beyond that. When Virginia asked if she was set with her turbot, Sarah brazenly lied, claiming she was. How close are you to the turbot and the tortellini? Paula, I'm ready and waiting for your call. Can we start bringing these plates up? Trusting her word, Virginia sent her Wellingtons to the pass, only to discover Sarah hadn't even begun cooking the turbot yet. And Ramsay wasn't pleased with either of them. Where's the turbot? Chef, I haven't fired it yet. In the aftermath, Sarah's reaction was chillingly remorseless. She seemed pretty pleased that her underhanded plan went, well, according to plan. She did start cooking it, Chef. So now you want to start lying to me. I'm not lying to you, Chef. She laughed silently as Virginia faced Ramsay's wrath for what he saw as sabotage. Sarah didn't speak up and say, Chef, I did tell her that I was ready. She should have at least spoken up and said something. Damn right she should have. In a word, it just really sucked to see Sarah put Virginia through that. Did I misunderstand you when I heard you say you were ready whenever I am? Uh, it was tortellini. I didn't but here comes one of the most unworthy winners of HK, Ariel Malone of season 15. And her betrayal during the second service was deviously underhanded. Three snapper, three chicken, I'm dying. That's gonna be five to the window, Chef. What's wrong with the snapper? While Mia stepped away for a moment, Ariel pounced on the opportunity, snatching her snapper and serving it up raw. We never said it was ready. Ariel come and grab it and took it up there. Oh my god, seriously. But when it came time to own up to it, Ariel conveniently sidestepped responsibility, refusing to admit to her blatant sabotage. Who cooked the snapper? Ariel could have said, oh, chef, my bad, I brought it up, but no. She stood there, letting Meese take the fall. God, talk about spinelessness. Fortunately, it earned her some rightful ire from Meese and Danny. You don't touch somebody else's dish. Then came the elimination nomination following the third service loss. Who is now finally up for elimination? Mies and, and um, Manda. Did I hear that right? Mies and Manda. But instead of sticking to the team's consensus, Ariel kept plotting behind everyone's back. She backstabbed Vanessa by scheming to get her eliminated while pretending to follow the team's agreed upon plan. Chef, our second nominee is Vanessa. At dismissal, Ariel shamelessly defended her underhanded tactics, citing Ramsey's supposed question about the team's weakest links. But let's call a spade a spade. Ariel's move was a manipulative, self-serving ploy that completely shattered the team's internal trust. Sure, the team had struggling members, but Ariel's actions reeked of disloyalty and cowardice. It wasn't just about the elimination, it was about trust and integrity which Ariel threw completely out the window. <sighs> now, that reminds me. 
Mia from season 18 is largely considered a fan favorite, but despite her popularity, there's this one moment I just can't let slide. And it went down during Tilly's sweet 16th birthday service. Happy birthday, Tilly! Chef the chef, let's go, duty. Tasked with the fish station alongside Ariel, her errors were not just glaring, but downright embarrassing. Can you get a bit more batter on the fish, please? More, more, more batter on the fish, make more it batter. thicker. Yes, chef. Sous chef Jockey rejected her fish for not being battered enough. But the real catastrophe came with her refire. It emerged from the kitchen raw. It's, you touch it! It's nice cold, chef. It's nice cold! And Ramsey was beyond angry. Wait for it. Give me the head and the tail, I'll put it back in the water. Mia. There it is, right on point. Eventually, their team ended up losing the service. Mia found herself in a hot seat of her own making. But instead of taking responsibility for her abysmal performance, she tried to deflect blame by pointing the finger at Kane, citing problems with the ahi tuna earlier in the service. Your tartar was getting sent back because it wasn't that sliced properly. Yeah. Yeah. Mia's downfall wasn't just about her poor performance. It was about deception and betrayal. Still, that didn't stop her from trying to squirm her way out of accountability. When I came to my station, I didn't have batter done. I didn't set it up, Chef. So Who I set it up? Kane set it up. When Ramsey questioned her capability, Mia tried throwing Kane under the bus again claiming that Kanae's prep failure led to her struggles during service. However, Kanae, backed up by Ariel, Regardless of who's set up, all stations were set up on time, so let's she's stop talking to play about that. Game right now. Made it clear that the batter was prepared as needed during prep, exposing Mia's attempt at deflecting blame as nothing but a lie to save face. I, I started making the batter as soon as we got into the kitchen. She's trying to play the blame game. Damn right she was. But that wasn't the end of Mia's deceit. When questioned why she believed she deserved to stay over Row, she claimed to have communicated with her team and taken responsibility for her actions. I was communicating the whole night. I do take ownership of my station. I'm a team player and I'm a leader too. However, her actions on the line and her attempts to blame others indicated quite the opposite. Like, I get it's a competition, but geez, have a little bit of decency. Now, let's talk about Baby Spice. Hey, Baby Spice, as long as you're okay, right? Yeah, no, Chef. Here's my food everybody else. Well, on the meat station, Sabrina showed her true colors in the very first service, when she decided to go against her team's strategy. When Ramsey cautioned her to wait for Lisa's scallops before starting her Wellingtons, Sabrina forged ahead without paying that bit of advice any attention whatsoever. Sabrina, hold up on that. We need the salmon and the tagliatelle first before anything else. Dude, I can't wait! Ignoring even more advice from Gail, she was hell-bent on sending out her Wellingtons early. I just spent like 20 minutes cooking all this, letting it rest, doing it right, you know? As if that was gonna go well. Why are you throwing them under the bus? I'm not sure. What can I do with it? Nothing, sure. Oh, f off. I think she totally deserved being up for elimination that night. You are quite frankly the most selfish cook in here. Ramsey's justified criticism didn't phase Sabrina. Instead, she stubbornly defended herself during the plea, indirectly pointing the finger at Lisa's age. She's Thank spent, you. Chef. You know, I'm young. The world is my what oyster. I'm Just spent. Me. Spend. Uh huh. That's definitely the problem here. Instead of reflecting on her own actions, she took yet another low blow at Nona, attempting to discredit her with even more petty and irrelevant excuses. Her idea of fine dining is fried chicken, chef. She can't cook asparagus. She snores and it keeps us all awake. Like, hold on for a minute. Is she for real? Sabrina's attempt to manipulate the elimination by bringing personal issues to the forefront not only showcased her lack of professionalism, but also highlighted her. Her willingness to betray a teammate by playing dirty in a competition that should have been about culinary skill, not personal vendettas. During the Italian night service, Sabrina's behavior towards Gail was yet another serious letdown. She was in charge of the grill, but struggled big time with timing, leaving Ramsey and her entire team in the dark. Um, chef, my pork. Just give me a fucking time! Okay, four minutes! Gail attempted to coordinate with Sabrina in spite of it all, but the inconsistent timing threw her off. How long on the 
second pork, Sabrina? Probably about seven, eight minutes. I don't trust Sabrina at all. She doesn't know her timing. Then, in a move that reeked of betrayal, she knowingly sent her dish out. Even though Gail wasn't ready with her pasta, she told her to wait. We're waiting for the pasta to happen. It just makes Gail look bad. <laughs> and yeah, everybody heard that. Yeah, it was a deliberate move to make Gail look bad. Plain and simple. Everybody thinks that I'm stupid, but you know what? I'm one manipulative f***er. Sabrina's actions were downright underhanded. Her confession painted her as someone who prioritized herself over the team as a collective. And honestly, who would want to work with someone like that? Instead of focusing on her own strengths during the elimination plea, she chose the path of least integrity. She was more concerned about pointing out others' weaknesses and throwing even more lame excuses out left and right. When it was her turn to speak up, Sabrina attempted to justify her spot by exaggerating her supposedly good performances, all the while conveniently using her inexperience as a safety net. Who would you rather have work for you? Somebody who has a title of an executive chef or somebody who hasn't been doing it this long? But Ramsey wasn't having any of it. He called her out, absolutely destroying her for using her inexperience as an excuse. Don't use that inexperience excuse on me ever again. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that was never gonna work. And by the way, this was something he made abundantly clear in previous seasons. I don't give two f's about how much experience you've got. What I do care about is who has the magic, who has it. Sabrina's pleas throughout the entire season were a disaster. Her over-the-top drama and all-too-common deflection absolutely stunk of immaturity and a lack of accountability. Instead of, you know, showing genuine passion or a willingness to learn from mistakes, she relied on empty excuses and pointed fingers. A hell of an unfortunate duo, if I've ever seen one. Now, let's talk about the time when Zacky pulled the wackiest move on Ray in Season 11. You see, right from the prep phase before the 11th service, when Ray offered his help, Zack blatantly ignored him, causing frustration among his teammates, including Anthony, who wasn't happy about Zack's sluggishness. Let's go, Zack. Can't be dragging ass. He needs to snap the hell out of it. Yeah, blatant disregard for teamwork and camaraderie. During the private dinner service, Zack's attempt to assist Ray on plating ended disastrously. Ramsey and Ray noticed Zack's sloppy plate with minimal pasta and no lobster. Hey, Zack, look at that, and look at that. There's no lobster in there, Zack. But you should be leaving this then. Tell it! This frustrated Ray, who rightfully questioned Zack's commitment, leading to a heated exchange. Zack, do me a favor. Fuck off from me, please. Take it over here. You're killing me. You're killing me. Try to throw me right, under the bus. During a refire, Ray requested him to finish cooking the lobster in butter. Zack retaliated by sabotaging it cooking it in a cold sauce instead. Earlier, Chef Ray tells me to f off, and I'm definitely gonna get revenge. I'm trying to sabotage him. Yeah, quite openly at that. Hey, come here, just touch that. It's cold! Ray, it's cold! This sabotage not only angered Ramsey, who obviously rejected the cold lobster, but also incited Ray's fury towards Zack for undermining the entire team. Later, when leading the New York strip course, Zach seemed really disinterested when John was asking about the sauce. Zach, where's your sauce at? Why can't he talk? He's not answering me. He's completely switched off. Yeah. Ramsey saw that the stakes weren't being seasoned like the red teams from a mile away, which sparked a confrontation, with Zach clumsily trying to defend himself and Ramsey accusing him of lying. We seasoned on this. No, are no, you lying? You did not slice it and season it. <sighs> it's always the seasoning, isn't it? And he really thought he could fool Ramsey. Go ahead and add his name to the list of the hundreds that came before him who've tried and failed. But in short, Zack's betrayal showed a complete lack of respect and teamwork. His actions not only disrupted service, but disrespected the hell out of his teammates, especially Ray. I'm so f pissed at Zack. I'm like, dude, you just, you f me. But with all that being said, I really have no idea how this happened. Ray, please give me your jacket. Yeah, sure. 
Ray often faces rightful criticism for his performance, but his elimination that night in favor of keeping Zack around was utterly absurd. Ramsey caught Zack red-handed, deliberately trying to sabotage Ray. Yet Ray got sent home over him? Gotta say, Ramsey, I do not understand the logic here. Unless you're looking for a deceitful head chef? Moving on, let's look at what happened during season 16's third service. During prep, she refused to communicate and openly stated that she wasn't in the mood to work, which really got under Aziza, Wendy, and Heather's skin. I just doing a whole lot of nothing. We're watching her the whole time. This lack of commitment and effort set a negative tone right from the start. What you working on? I don't know. I'm not in a mood right now. That's very lacy of her, pun intended. During dinner service, Gia's performance at the meat station was marred by inconsistencies and questionable actions. While her first attempt at the lamb was acceptable, her next one was overcooked. It's like feel, it's overcooked. Hello, an absolute meltdown. Her refire attempts were no better, culminating in Ramsey's shock at her Wellingtons being horrendously sliced. I've never ever in the history of Hell's Kitchen been given a Wellington's not even, not even sliced. Oh, and he wasn't done. It's like some bad from the woods, the most expensive cut anywhere in the world. And look at the way it's dumped. Who gave me this? What followed was a feeble attempt to excuse her blunder by claiming she nearly cut her finger off, prompting Ramsey to call for medical assistance. Sorry, I cut my finger off, Chef. You cut your finger off? Yes. Show me. So get the medic. Medic! However, Ramsey's attempt to verify her injury exposed Gia's ruse. Despite her claims of a near finger amputation, there was no visible cut or any blood on her finger at all. Where's the cut? Where's the cut? Right here. Where? It's not there. So she wanted an easy way out. The red team lost the service, and during deliberations, this happened. But who's volunteering themselves to go up tonight? I'll do it. I'll do it. I Eventually, Jen volunteered, and Gia was nominated. <laughs> I'm not an arguer. I hate arguing. I lived with that in my family, and I just don't like it. But Jessica's plea for staying in Hell's Kitchen really shed light on her personal struggles. She admitted to nominating herself out of a deep-rooted fear of arguments, a trauma rooted in her past experiences of growing up in a household filled with constant conflict. This revelation hinted at a potential battle with PTSD resulting from her dysfunctional family environment. It seems that her coping mechanism involved avoiding disputes, making her self-nomination a means to dodge future potential conflicts within the team. On the flip side, here's what Gia said. Anytime I'm in the kitchen, I'm working hard, always ready to help one of my teammates. I don't never come in here with an attitude. Hey, you know you were being recorded, right? We saw you stand and give up on your team during prep because, oh, not in the mood. But wait, she had more to add. She's already packed. I'm not packed. I'm ready to stay here. This move to spill dorm secrets to Ramsey didn't earn her any popularity points. She was seen as a rat for not upholding team solidarity. Jessica, you've packed. You are not ready to head to Vegas. Despite Ramsey's earlier stance on dorm issues, meaning he clearly said that he didn't care about what goes on in the dorms, his choice to ax Jessica over Gia's betrayal seemed unjust and went against his own stated policy. I guess what I'm trying to say is that these events brought Ramsey's fairness into question. Jessica's struggles and her coping mechanism should have been considered more empathetically especially since her performance wasn't notably worse than Gia's. I genuinely couldn't grasp what Ramsey saw in Gia. To me, it seemed like one of the most straightforward decisions on the show to eliminate her. However, instead of Gia leaving, Jessica went home instead. Sure, Jessica's mistake in packing was bad, but she only messed up one plate throughout that whole service. Her other services showed improvement, either performing well or bouncing back after a slip-up. On the other hand, Gia lied about her finger injury and completely messed up the meat. I mean, come on, it's night and day. But I'm curious what your take on all of this is. Meanwhile, let me hop over to the next topic. Now, in Season 9, following a challenging service, Ramsey tasked the final five chefs with a crucial decision nominating two individuals for elimination. 
Elise orchestrated a calculated move. She individually approached both Will and Paul, artfully persuading them to consider Jennifer as the weakest link among the remaining chefs. I am asking you for a favor. When I go up there, I'm going to put Jennifer as the weakest because she is. Typical high school shit. Just say that in front of everyone. Why the backhandedness? She was only looking out for herself by pitting the others against Jennifer like that. I'm being diplomatic and I'm asking you to look out for me because I will look out for you. I know you're better than me. God, how low was she willing to go? But Jennifer was wise to Elise's sly tactics. Confident in her own abilities and considering herself superior to Elise in various aspects, she hoped that Paul and Will would see through Elise's manipulation. After all the she's put us through, Will and Paul are smart enough not to fall for Elise's One can only hope. The deliberation turned into a tense chess game as Ramsay probed the chefs for their nominations. Who is the weakest chef? Come on, man, it's an easy answer. But Paul struggled to make a definitive choice first, prompting Will to abruptly lend his support to Elise as the stronger chef, much to Jennifer's and, frankly, my disbelief. Solely based on cooking, chef? Uh, Pure I, cooking. I think Elise is a stronger cook than Jennifer. Is. It was tough to watch. Eventually, Paul sided with Elise as being the stronger cook too. Who's the worst cook? Jennifer Chef. You Thank are you. Kidding me? I'm, just, I'm being honest. At least Tommy didn't give in to the pressure and did the right thing by saying that Elise was the weakest link. This sequence of events culminated in the heartbreaking elimination of Jennifer. Despite her undeniable talent and consistent performance throughout the competition, the strategic manipulation orchestrated by Elise and the wavering decisions of her fellow contestants led to Jennifer's unjust departure. I can't believe you two would actually sit here and say that she is better than me. I am. And fans weren't happy. Everyone agreed that Jennifer should have stayed instead. And I mean, hear, here. Will and Paul were manipulated to backstab Jennifer, but it's not like they didn't have any personal motive in this. Jennifer was obviously the better chef and therefore the biggest threat. At least Tommy had integrity and wanted to have an equal fight in the end. What do you think? But what this contestant did to her teammate backfired real bad. She said that she's ready when I am. I'm ready, wait for your call. But look what happened. Virginia reclaimed her immunity and eliminated her from the final three. Take off your jacket. Yes, sir. And leave Hell's Kitchen. Sweet, sweet revenge. And well, this reminds me of Russell from season eight, who, without a shred of doubt, was an aggressive douche nozzle throughout his season. Step off. Wait, watch your language. Watch my language? I'm a grown ass man. I mean, this dude was super cocky. But for what? To lose the finale to Nona? You guys me so royally today. If that was his goal, he met it with flying colors. And then in season 16, Andrew and Johnny were really, really mean to Kimberly. They bullied her and didn't believe she could go far in the competition. But guess what? Kimberly proved them wrong. She made it farther than both of them and even earned her spot in the black jackets, while her bullies didn't make it anywhere near as far. Plus, given how sexist the blue team was in season 16, oh boy, you can imagine how well the rest of them did. On the red side, because too much estrogen in one kitchen is not good. I mean, the all-female final three proved that much and more, right? Three very talented chefs, let me tell you. So, what other examples can you think of? For me, I remember this one thing from season seven, episode eight. Oh, I understand, I understand. Shut the up. You don't understand anything. You're lucky to be here. And she did. But Mr. Politician was busy being condescending. You may be a great cook, but don't be rude. God, could you be even more wrong? So, Ramsey announced a fun challenge. I want to test each and every one of you for your level of creativity. Each chef had just 30 minutes to whip up a mouth-watering sandwich. If the season 17 boys were here, they'd be in shambles. Anyway, before heading back to the kitchen, they all got a list of ingredients they could use. Create something just as exciting, yes? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, let's go. The clock started ticking, and the chefs dashed into the kitchen to start crafting their sandwiches. In the red kitchen, Benjamin asked about the tuna, and Siobhan said she already had hers. Is anybody looking for tuna? I got my tuna already. He then arrogantly reminded her to trim off the bloodline, but Siobhan brushed it off, feeling targeted by Benjamin. 
He cut the bloodline off it, Siobhan. Yeah, my tuna doesn't have much of the bloodline on it, actually. Well, she was determined to prove to Ramsey that she had what it took. That's all that matters. His opinion to me, I don't give a You go, girl. Prior to the judging, Ramsey instructed the red team to eliminate one of their sandwiches due to having an extra member. And then this I, like here my, looks light. I don't care. I like my sandwich. I'm not backing down. And they swiftly discarded Siobhan's creation, with Benjamin making his dissatisfaction very clear. If I got Siobhan's sandwich when I was eating it at a restaurant, I'd be pissed. Siobhan felt frustrated by yet another setback, but soon things were about to change. With the score of both teams tied at three, Ramsey called Siobhan over to taste her sandwich. I'm gonna break the tie. Siobhan. However, Benjamin remained skeptical, doubting she could pull it off. That, that just sucks. I mean, we're gonna have to rely on her to get the job done. Siobhan presented her ahi tuna sandwich with challah bread, cheese, grilled pineapple, oranges, and prosciutto, which Ramsey said was even better than France. For that, blue team. You win. Look at Benjamin's face. Consequently, the blue team clinched the challenge victory. Siobhan felt rightly furious that her teammates doubted her cooking skills and was glad they were to blame for the loss. Now, all the way back in season one, after Jeff left Hell's Kitchen, he bumped into Ramsey in the parking lot after calling him an asshole. You're an asshole. Things got intense real quick, and they ended up in a physical fight. Jeff got shoved to the ground and he hurt his ankle pretty bad. He had to go to the hospital to get it checked out. Ramsey didn't mean for things to get so out of hand, but Jeff ended up with a sprained ankle anyway. Unbelievable. That is not fucking cool. The network freaked out because of the whole situation and started scrambling to deal with any legal issues that might come up. And Ramsey, who's not known for being great at apologizing, also talked about what happened with Jeff on set. I've called you fat. I've criticized your restaurants. He admitted that he got really angry at the contestant, but he didn't mean for things to get physical between them. The guy wound me up and I got angry. He hurt his ankle when he fell. It wasn't intentional. I'm Gordon Ramsay for goodness sake. People know I'm volatile, but I didn't mean to hurt the guy. His words. I want to do is look at your cute face and think, blubber, blubber, blubber. <laughs> Ramsey's top-notch legal team helped keep the incident from blowing up into a major problem. And he must have really learned his lesson after this, because he was in a similar situation in season six, but managed to get out of it without physical altercation this time. Yeah, I'm talking about Joseph Tinnelly's incident. He, on the other hand, did get his karma though. Following the disastrous second service that season, both teams were named joint losers, and Ramsey asked them to nominate two people for elimination. And then came the famous question. Who's the first nominee for the men? And what was Joseph's response? They can speak for themselves, but they know who they are. Well, it certainly didn't sit well with Ramsey, I can tell you that much. Instead of naming a nominee and, you know, providing a reason, Joseph argued that his teammates should speak for themselves. A smart ass. I asked you to tell me. Ramsey wasn't impressed with the defiance, but Joseph, he expected each chef to take responsibility for their decisions and justify their own choices. When Ramsey pressed him a second time to name the nominees, he reluctantly mentioned Tony and Andy. However, Ramsey wasn't satisfied and demanded and an explanation for the nominations. You may be slightly stupid. Joseph named Tony again, but reiterated that he knew why. And then came the confrontation. All the while, Joseph was quadrupling down on the notion that the nominations were a group decision, asserting that they didn't need pressure from anyone. We sat down as a group, let everyone pick each other, you know? Oh, thanks for clarifying. Ramsey then sarcastically asked him if he wanted a medal for his actions, but Joseph remained resistant. We chose as a group, and they stood out and they said they belonged there. As Ramsey approached him to bring him back to reality and, oh, I don't know, follow instructions, Joseph continued to ramble, asserting that he wasn't a pushover. I ain't no chef. I don't give a I ain't no Nobody was saying you were, bro.
Now, in case you haven't heard about the theories and the behind the scenes secrets about this random outburst, make sure to watch this video right here. There's a lot more than meets the eye going on here. Well, no matter what was going on, he then confronted fellow contestants like Robert, Ariel, Suzanne, and Tack, telling them bluntly to shut their mouths. Joseph's irritation towards Ramsey was pretty evident. Joseph further escalated the situation by removing his jacket throwing it to the ground and walking aggressively towards Ramsey, challenging him to a fight. You may be slightly stupid. As Joseph stormed towards Ramsey, fueled by anger and insults, two security guards stepped in to prevent uh, another Jeff incident. And despite Ramsey's attempts to defuse the situation calmly, Joseph continued to hurl all those insults. I ain't no fucking bitch, Jeff. I don't give a fuck. I ain't no bitch. Ramsey, clearly fed up with Joseph's behavior like 20 minutes ago, promptly ordered him to leave. Joseph made quite the declaration during his exit. As Joseph made his exit, he flipped everyone off as he went and nearly tripped on the step. Karma's a bitch, ain't she, Joseph? Well, Ramsey added the final touch by nonchalantly kicking Joseph's jacket to the side as he left. Though, I admit that I'd love to see him kicking the guy's ass instead. This next contestant gave a hard time to not one, not even two, but all of her teammates. And I can't think of anyone better for that job than Jackie. There are two important things you should know about her right away. I'm tough, I'm beautiful, I'm sexy, I will kick your ass and suck your dick all in the same time. You see, before the fourth dinner service, she renamed the prep list to this. I'm gonna put the list. Yeah, if you missed it in the video, here's a closer look. Classy, right? But sadly for her, that wasn't gonna fly. Sous chef Christina Wilson absolutely destroyed her. Like, absolutely no holds barred. Never again, I swear to God. Is any Shut up! She did not think that was very fun. Nobody did, Jackie. She really didn't stand a chance. I mean, she was up against the same chef who survived season 10's notorious red team. If any of this happens in this kitchen again, whoever writes it will be finishing the list. Take a seat. Have a seat and sit down. Just sit down. I mean, that's Gordon's protege right there. You can see he trained her right. She was not going to take that disrespect. She sent Jackie to the chef's table, made it clear that she'd have fired her had this happened in her kitchen. But even still, someone seemed to have not outgrown her angsty teenage phase. It's a professional kitchen. You want to have it? Oh, you don't care? No, no. You don't care? No, no. Literally a rebel without a cause. Remember how Christina Wilson identified Robin as the cancer in her team during her season? She bestowed the same title on Jackie this time around. Find the cancer in your team and work around it. Later, during their break, Jackie tried to justify what she had done by saying she's a jokey person who gets serious during service, but that her humor just kind of went over our heads. I'm the type of person that where I could joke, 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 and then boom, jump into service and get done. But these morons don't see that. To be fair, you need to have a very high IQ to understand Jackie's comedy. <laughs> well, she was good at one thing, though, which was constantly provoking her teammates. You know what I should be doing? Breaking your face right now. But what was absolutely horrifying was the heated exchange in the 10th episode when Jackie decided to mock Kristen, questioning how it felt to be working on the same level as someone who had just started cooking. Kristen, not one to back down, fired back by stating that Jackie had no clue what she was doing either, despite her three months of experience. She didn't mince her words when she added that she saw right through Jackie's facade. You've only been cooking three months. You don't know what the f you're doing. Everything about you is a sack of Things escalated further when Kristen refused to give Jackie a lighter. But she snatched it from Kristen and taunted her, challenging her to make good on her threat. This tense standoff reached its peak when Jackie threw Kristen's lighter to the ground, pushing Kristen's patience to the limit. Jackie, Jackie give me my lighter. Give me my lighter. Either light your cigarette or give me my lighter. Like you saw, Jackie persistently kept taunting Kristen to hit her, and even going as far as to dump the ashtray on her. God, that's absolutely vile. Kristen eventually reached her breaking point, declaring that she'd had enough, and left the patio. High time, right? But Jackie wasn't through with her. Put your hands on me. Get the out of my face. Put your hands on me, bitch. You serious? Get 
Garrett! Assault should have been grounds for immediate disqualification. Like, I'm not crazy for thinking that, right? Anybody want to play devil's advocate? Probably not. After she confessed that it was her strategy to manipulate Kristen. It's a game now, and it is to with your mind. Oh, boy. Mind games stem from a place of immaturity and insecurity. But I'm not surprised given that Jackie was deceptive from day one. Now, this next contestant seemed to derive some kind of strange, sadistic pleasure seeing her own team fail. But now, it's time to meet another contestant who was unnecessarily mean and crude towards others. In fact, he took pride in her. I don't know why you even look at me. Like, just stop talking to me for the rest of this season. Thank you. Good. This Redditor thinks that Johnny might genuinely be a sociopath. At the very least, he has some serious mommy issues to sort out. Some of his confessionals made absolutely no sense. Like, what did he mean by this? Who taught her to cook like that? It's really annoying when, like, cute little girls cook really well. Ugh, what a tool. There's no excuse for a grown-ass man to gain emotional satisfaction by humiliating others. I've never dealt with this kind of bullying before, so it's rough. I don't know if they're intimidated or they really don't like me now. For Johnny, though, cruelty is pleasurable, even exciting. So he was willing to put in that extra effort to make someone else suffer. In episode four, he had a new target, Kimberly. He began by calling her voice annoying and eagerly anticipated the moment when he could witness her tears. The exact kind of like stuff I do, I just can't wait to make her cry. All right, rat face. I have a rat face? Go chew on some cheese, rat. He must have thought himself assertive, but in reality, you could stop at the first three letters. Kimberly thankfully deflected his bullying. She stood up to him and was absolutely right in saying this. Why don't you start acting like a gentleman and be respectful to people and stop trying to rip on people because you feel about yourself? Yep, he wanted everyone to cower and submit to his abuse for his perverse gratification. Oh, what a weirdo. Johnny neither had the talent nor skill to back him up. I wonder how he survived so long in the competition. But his elimination was one of the best, most satisfying moments ever. I bet you were laughing too, seeing him struggle to accept his defeat because boy, did he have a meltdown. And for me to be standing here right now, I wanna rip out the beautiful hair in my head. Yeah, please do. Next to Johnny, I also loathe Andrew Pierce from this season because he led Heather on while being engaged in real life. Dude was a walking red flag. Like, hear it from Heather herself. He was single yeah. and supposedly seeking me out. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to do my homework for social media before I do that. And I'm glad I did because here he was dating a woman and she was all over his Instagram. And he ended up having a child with her. <laughs> and I'm like, thank God I dodged that bullet because I would have ended up stuck with that man for the rest of my life. What's worse is that she was made to look like the other woman and was subjected to nasty comments online. Damn, Andrew, you give love a bad name. Next up, we have the weirdest guy from the show. And trust me, I call him weird with good reason. I guess the inspiration from that came from the fact that I've raised and butchered most. To eat them raw. I don't know if the producers use those sound effects to make him look that way on purpose, but he gives his answer with the blankest stare, and it doesn't exactly help his case. Now, in the second service, things got even weirder. It all started when his mashed potatoes got sent back for being too runny. Now, instead of addressing the issue in a straightforward manner, Andrew decided to take the batch and mix it with a fresh one he was preparing. Ramsey, as you can imagine, was far from pleased with this approach. When Ramsey attempted to explain why this was a big no-no, Andrew talked back and actually insisted that his idea was brilliant. So we're serving liquid fucking mashed potatoes. So I expect you to put that fucking fresh stuff in a pan and you add the liquid to it. Uh-oh. We know that look. Ramsey, reaching the end of his rope, made it clear that he was losing his temper. But Andrew, perhaps immune to social cues, continued to talk back. This landed him a one-way ticket out of the kitchen. You don't care, you got no respect, and you know what? You're a fucking joke to the industry. Yeah, that's what you are. And here's where the situation takes an even more peculiar turn. Jean-Philippe tried to convince Andrew to stay. 
suggesting that Ramsey might just be testing him. I don't know how many people which would be willing to be in your shoes. Andrew, though, wasn't interested in coming back and kicked his shoes off quite literally. I mean, take my shoes, Jake. I don't need this. I'm walking out these doors. His nonchalance, his soulless stares. Man, this was one of the most unpredictable moments ever. I was as shocked as JP there. Good God, what a guy. When I win this competition, I'm gonna buy two walk-in coolers. That's all I really want. I hope he got those two walk-in coolers. Although, I dread to know what he would have done with them. Anyway, quickly moving on, we have Amber and her delusions of grandeur. Remember when she said, I've trained at the renowned Cordon Bleu in France, worked under a cadre of celebrity chefs, so naturally, everyone else pales in comparison. But hold your applause because maintaining such an ego trip is like the hallmark of immaturity, especially when her performance during the services were so inconsistent. So despite not being able to back up her talk, Amber couldn't quite come down from her pedestal. Now, let's rewind to the moment Amber had a full-blown meltdown, because Corey didn't pick her for the grand finale. It's just business, so it is what it is. When they discover the center of the universe, she is gonna be so disappointed that she's not it. She just had to confront Corey that very night, as if it was a personal affront. Corey tried to explain it wasn't personal, but Amber sailed right over that explanation. She proceeded to gripe about Corey's decision to anyone within earshot, acting like it was doomsday. My feelings were hurt that she didn't call on me. If she didn't want me, then that's her loss. And even though she claimed to have moved on the next day, she simply couldn't resist giving Corey a hard time about it, all while making sure the world knew it was Corey's loss. Good gracious, Amber. She took pleasure in imagining Corey's impending suffering for not selecting her, but in reality, Corey dodged a bullet. I mean, not only did Amber forget to send out chicken with her entrees, but she also had the audacity to send raw chicken to the pass. When Mary Lou had to ask Cody to step in due to Amber's consistent blunders, guess what Amber had up her sleeve? Another flimsy excuse. It's just so annoying because it's like, boy toy to the rescue. When Amber was invited to join the blue team, her response? A downright surly attitude, naturally. Fast forward a bit, and when the blue team extended the olive branch, asking what was bothering her, her response was utterly baffling. I'm not into losing. What the this was especially puzzling since the blue team had clinched a victory the previous night and had been quite competitive in the challenges. They were far from a team of losers, but Amber couldn't seem to place any trust in her comrades. Speaking of trust, Amber had a knack for belittling others while inflating her own self-worth. They're ready to throw me off the boat with a brick tied to my leg and let me go under. Now, I get those Instagram-approved self-love quotes, okay, but... Amber had a knack for sweeping her own kitchen mishaps under the rug. I honestly just feel like at this point I should just keep my knowledge and my skills to myself. She openly mocked poor Nikki for her youth and acted as though Nikki couldn't possibly be qualified to be a sous chef, all while flaunting her own glorious resume. Like seriously, some people simply cannot get over themselves. Now watch this next chef's performance from season three and tell me what you think was wrong with her. This woman was stationed at the appetizer station. This was her moment to shine, her time to lead, or so she thought. But alas, her risotto turned out to be a salty disaster, forcing the entire team to hit the reset button. Not once, not twice, but thrice did she have to redo her risotto. Bravo, truly an inspiration in consistency. Ah, but... Wait, on her third attempt, Ramsey smelled something funny in the air. I smell that. Hey, you, don't you f yeah. Come here, you. Hello. Yeah. Oh, God. Turns out, she had been using crab that had gone rancid. How can you do that? I didn't smell the crab, sir. Look at Ramsey's eyes. He was genuinely horrified, and rightly so. That shit could have killed somebody. Everyone was utterly shocked. Like, this couldn't be just brushed off as careless. This was serious, you guys. We sent one out already. No, shall we? Thank have God for that. You'll kill someone. And just as you'd expect, she was kicked off her station immediately. Ramsey was so furious and disappointed. No. No. Recommend, yeah, recommend a new restaurant. Now, if you can't put a name to her face, that's okay. She was pretty forgettable, except for this teeny, tiny, lethal mistake. But just to do my due diligence, her name is Joanna. 
And I don't think she had any other notable moments on the show. But now, a lot of you might be expecting Raj's name to be on the list. But I mean it when I say that Raj might be one of the best contestants. Uh, hear me out. He hadn't done anything mean-spirited, despite the fact that his entire team made heartless, merciless comments towards him. Go home and stuff yourself with Twinkies so you have a fucking heart attack on your recliner. Oh, so now you're gonna make fun of my weight. I'll admit, Trev crossed the line. It was uncalled for. The men made such ruthless attacks on the guy and with so much vitriol. You're attacking me, motherfucker. Fuck you, man. You're a waste of life. Here's some perspective, though. Taking a moment to stick his head into the cold, dark, walled freezer might seem unusual to some, but for Raj, it's a way to reduce sensory overload and find a sense of grounding. Raj's social interactions often appear awkward, and he faces challenges when it comes to understanding verbal instructions. It's not uncommon for him to ask for things to be repeated or interpret information in ways that were not intended. Given Raj's behavior on the show, some fans have speculated that he may be on the autism spectrum. There's no definitive way of knowing, but in light of this possibility, it's important for us to be sensitive and compassionate rather than to mock him. You can try to dodge karma, but good luck doing that with Gordon Ramsay watching. It's like he has a sixth sense for it. So, I'm referring to Adam Livao from season 14, who came in at number 10. In the signature dish challenge, he got off to a fantastic start, even impressing Ramsay. What's more, my man landed with a perfect score of 4 on his first dish. But then, things started going downhill. During the Alaskan Fish Challenge on the third day, the blue team emerged as the winners, granting them a 5 minute head start. Despite the advantage, Adam couldn't match their pace and struggled to keep up with the competition. But unfortunately, Adam was in a tight spot because he couldn't finish his rice on time. While the blue team was busy trying to impress Ramsey, he turned to his partner for some assistance. I got that. That's what being a good teammate is all about, right? But man, oh man, it ended up being a massive screw up. Adam and Millie Medley were the last ones to show off their grub to judge Michael Chimarusti, and they were hoping to tie up the competition, since they were down 2-1 against the women on the red team. Adam's pan-seared halibut with grilled baby bok choy and basmati rice totally wowed Judge Chimarusti. I mean, their reaction was legit. But then, Millie went and served his dish of halibut francaise butter with bell pepper rice. Notice anything similar between the two? Go on, I'll give you a sec to think it over. Yeah, both dishes had rice in them. What are the odds, right? As the judge started to get suspicious, Adam's face went white as a sheet. Someone just got busted. Like, seriously, just look at the guy. Did you guys share on that one, or? Yeah, no. Ramsey wasn't about to let something like that slide. He jumped right in on the suspicion and straight up asked Adam if he borrowed Millie's rice. And what do you know, he was right on the money. When confronted, Adam couldn't fool Ramsey. He knew he had to come clean or things were gonna end up being even worse for him. Yes, sir. He had no choice but to confess that he used Millie's rice. And you know what that meant? His dish wasn't entirely his. What do you even do in that sort of situation? Share the points? Well, that sort of thing doesn't happen in Hell's Kitchen, and Ramsay wasn't gonna move heaven and earth to let Adam get away with it. Well, while Adam's dish may have been better than Millie's, there was no way that a stunt like that would tie things up with the women, meaning that the blue team lost the challenge three to one. The thing that really gets me about this is that the blue team had a five minute head start going into the thing. And instead of making the most of the advantage, Adam had to cheat and hand the points over to the red team. Since they lost, that meant they had to pay the price. They got stuck with the seafood delivery day and prepping fish for the next service. Talk about a major setback. We have halibut that three people have to carry, scale and gut. We got red snapper. They but have you heard about that one contestant who was a total troublemaker and got on everyone's nerves? Yeah, I know. I didn't exactly narrow it down there. With that description, we could be talking about Robin Elmo Devar, Jen Gavin, or even Jason Underwood. But today, we're talking about the one and only Elise Harris. Yep, everyone's favorite drama queen. Despite being a walking train wreck, Elise appeared not once, but twice on Hell's Kitchen. Did the producers do it to try and get their numbers up? Well, I wouldn't be surprised. 
because Elise might have been frustrating for her fellow contestants, but to us viewers, she was as entertaining as the best of them. It's crazy how in season 9, she somehow made it to third place. I mean, this is like a real mystery. And then, she came back for season 17. But this time around, luck wasn't on her side, and she landed in 7th place instead. Not exactly the improvement she was looking for. In hindsight, it's not too bad a performance, considering her attitude on the show. Anyway, coming back to how Elise tried to cheat her way out of trouble. During the dinner service, Elise was on the appetizer station with Elizabeth. Right from the start, she was shouting over Ramsey, interrupting him before he could even finish the ticket. And well, that's the last thing anyone should ever do when Ramsey's expediting, especially in the middle of a heated service. He called her out and asked her to repeat the ticket instead. And you have to see how that went down. Y'all ready? We need one scallop, two risotto for appetizers. But the struggle bus didn't stop there. When Carrie sent her scallops, Elise wasn't ready with her risotto. And when she finally served it, it was a disaster. Stop! No chance. It doesn't even look like a Risotto. Ew, that's so runny and gross. Were you trying to make rice pudding there, Elise? Uh, trust me, after seeing this, Ramsey definitely wanted to kick her ass. And although Krupa tried to help her, Elise acted all high and mighty, saying that she was better and could beat her blindfolded and with a broken arm. But the karma on Hell's Kitchen is real. Because when Krupa nailed a perfect risotto, Elise was left speechless. Later, Elise got up in Carrie's business when she saw her struggling with scallops. Not skipping a beat, Elise just jumped onto the fish station without permission, stealing Carrie's job like it was nothing. What's more, she was trash talking all the while. She even claimed she did it to impress Ramsey and be a team player, but Ramsey wasn't buying it. And we can't even send a table together because nobody's together. Smooth service, my ass. He punished her by making her sit at the chef's table while Krupa enjoyed the show. You, f off, sit on the chef's table. But it didn't end there. Customers started walking out. The death knell of any restaurant service. Despite all the drama and her behavior going against the show's spirit of cooperation and professionalism, the red team somehow managed to win the service. Can you believe it? She got away with it, even though it was a total circus. This next contestant thought they could cheat without getting caught, but Ramsey didn't hesitate to give her a piece of his mind. In the sixth episode of season nine, things got heated during prep time. Carrie was all frustrated because for some reason, no one seemed to be taking their job seriously. But guess what? Elise further added fuel to the fire when she accused Carrie of basically trying to make them all look like they didn't give a damn. And boom. That very instant, a huge argument broke out between the two. Elise, can I please talk for make one? I just don't like how you try to act like no one else around you is taking it serious. Woo, jolly cooperation. Anyway, let's head into the dinner service. Carrie was holding down the fort at the appetizer station with Jennifer, and it looks like she held on to that sourness from the argument earlier because this time, she sent up her salads even though Krupa wasn't ready with her pot stickers. And let me tell you this, Ramsey wasn't amused. I'll f off with you. Here you go. As far as I'm concerned, you can f off. Start again. Yes, yes. He handed her back the salads and hit the reset button, ordering the red team to start the whole ticket from scratch. Later, Carrie tried to make up for it and lent Krupa a hand on garnish duty. But this is where she goofed up. Carrie is hoping to impress Chef Ramsay with her speed. I have no idea why she thought it was okay to dump a whole lot of fresh rice onto a plate that already had a bunch of old rice left on it. Ramsay couldn't even believe his eyes. Carrie, look at me, look at me! Are you adding the old rice into the fresh rice as we're eating it? I'm watching okay. everything you're doing. Yeah. Well, Carrie was clearly trying to cut corners. But that's not how it works in Ramsey's kitchen. He literally schooled her and trashed the entire pan of rice. Talk about a slip up. But hey, things somehow turned around for the better. The red team ended up winning the service after managing to nail both the team's orders. Carrie was feeling pretty good about it. 
Especially after finding out the blue team got the boot. Eh, I guess you win this round, Carrie. Well, at least things worked out in her favor. Now, on the topic of professionalism, or the lack thereof, in the case of Seth Levine, a contestant from season 5, he ended up in 13th place, and episode 4 was a real disaster for him. Assigned to the fish station during dinner service, Seth's first attempt at cooking scallops turned out rubbery, and Jay called him out on his lack of basic cooking skills. To teach him a lesson, Ramsey took matters into his own hands, and you have to see what he did. There you go, eat it, go on. Surprisingly, instead of being embarrassed, Seth claimed he enjoyed the overcooked scallops, explaining that he hadn't eaten dinner before the service. Talk about trying to save face. But the night only got worse for Seth. When Ramsey called out the next ticket order for the blue team, Seth was completely unfocused and couldn't repeat the order. And then the unthinkable happened. What is he doing? Hey you, hey you, come here. Damn. Don't tell me he did that. He, he used a cloth to wipe his face, which, mind you, was the same one he was using to clean the pans. Gross! Ramsey was rightfully furious and gave him a serious scolding for being so blatantly unhygienic. I mean, that was completely unacceptable. As if things couldn't get any worse, both teams ended up being named joint losers that night, and they each had to nominate two contestants for elimination. During the deliberations, Giovanni nominated Seth, pointing out the cloth incident as one of the major problems that night. Which, I mean, come on, it absolutely was. And Robert agreed. All in all, it was a disastrous night for Seth. And that one small but grossly disastrous mistake didn't go unnoticed by Ramsey or his fellow contestants. But now, I have the honor of introducing our next ingenious contestant, Barbie Marshall, who came in 4th place in Season 10 and 9th place in Season 17. So let's dive into the chaos of the 5th day of dinner service when she was working with Christina Wilson on a Mexican night theme. Marshall faced a disappointing start by sending up one pan of flavorless mussels and another that was perfectly executed. To Ramsey's abject horror, and why wouldn't he be? I once totally abandoned and abused, even the color's different. Bland, delicious. But despite the setback, she managed to redeem herself after refiring them, saving the day, at least as far as the red team's appetizers were concerned. However, things took a turn for the worse when they got to the entrees. In a desperate attempt to salvage a situation going horribly wrong, Marshall made an unusual move. Today we need, look at me, a thermometer. Oh no, she didn't. Well, she used a thermometer to check the chicken, much to everyone's surprise. Now, this might seem okay to you, like we see this sort of thing on MasterChef all the time. And I know I love my new thermometer, but at this level of competition, in Hell's Kitchen no less, you better know how well the chicken is cooked, just by how it looks and feels. And while she was busy at work sneaking in her little tool to help her assess the cook on the bird, Ramsey caught her in the act and how he reacted was absolutely priceless. For us, anyway. For her, well... The day we need that to cook a breast of chicken, you get out! Anyway, during deliberations, a surprising twist occurred when Marshall nominated herself, arguing that she wasn't the weakest chef and didn't deserve to be on the chopping block. Astonishingly, Ramsey agreed with her and allowed her to stay, leaving viewers shocked. Well, I sure was, but were you? I can't help but wonder why these contestants always try to push Ramsey's buttons and test his patience so often. Like, if you play with fire, you're bound to get burned. And speaking of something that was the opposite of burned, this next contestant, Joshua Travato, committed one of Gordon's biggest pet peeves, cutting raw meat without checking if it was cooked first. During the dinner service, Josh got stuck at the meat station, and man, did he mess up big time. Brendan had to call him out for overcooking the halibut and asked him to fix it, but instead of taking the note and handling it, Josh got annoyed because he thought his wellingtons were perfectly cooked. Talk about being overconfident. However, Ramsey took one look at them and instantly knew they were raw as can be. Stop! All of you come here! 
Ramsey didn't skip a beat and scolded him for his back-to-back -back rookie mistakes. But even after that, things still didn't improve for Josh. He kept rushing orders and even sliced into some lamb. That was still raw. Come here, you. Here, bring that over. Ramsey had no other recourse but to pull him aside, give him a serious talking to, and kick him out of the kitchen. One third of them are cooked, and the center bits are raw. When you slice it and it's not right, what, what, what do you do? And you stop what? I stopped thinking. You stop slicing. Yes, sir. But no, you slice them all, get out. Luckily for Josh, he managed to avoid the elimination, somehow. You know, I'm still trying to figure out how that happened. Unlike this next contestant, who totally brushed off Ramsey's direction and decided to do her own thing. But when Ramsey caught wind of it, things went from zero to hysterical real quick. You know how challenges involving eggs are always exciting, right? Uh, well, anyway, Season 7's Egg Relay Challenge was no different. The goal was to cook up four egg dishes, poached, soft-boiled, sunny-side up, and scrambled. Sounds like a walk in the park, right? But here's the twist. It was all about testing if the chefs could handle the heat and cook something as basic as eggs without stumbling. Now, the red team was one member short, and since it was a paired challenge, Siobhan Allgood was left to handle all the eggs on her own. How tough could that be? Turns out, it's way more difficult than you could imagine. The teams had a measly five minutes to cook the eggs to perfection. But oh boy, Siobhan started freaking out because she was flying solo. I'm a little nervous about being on my own, but I'm gonna kick butt whether I'm by myself or with other people. And then, she made the mother of all mistakes when she decided to team up with Autumn Lewis and Fran Clyer without Ramsey's permission. Siobhan, work with me and Fran, all no right? Problem. Now, whether it was because she was under pressure or not, Siobhan had just thrown Ramsey's instructions right out the window, and Autumn ended up getting her hands on the sunny side up. Oh. Siobhan, I got your sunny side up. And you do scramble. When it was time for the judgment, Ramsey threw her a curveball and asked how long she had boiled the soft-boiled egg for. And what was her answer? You won't believe what she said. My teammates helped me, Chef. Your teammates helped you. I asked you to work on your own. And Ramsey's face says it all. He was like, are you serious? But wait, it gets even worse. Siobhan's explanation pushed all of Ramsey's buttons. Like, what pressure was she even talking about? Truth is, Ramsey would have actually given her dish a pass. Well, obviously, he knew she was working all by herself. But Siobhan left him stunned when she started blaming her teammates for her actions. Because there was pressure from my team. Are you serious? From, from, not from my team, from Autumn. Okay, I don't remember anyone forcing her to do anything. Autumn just threw out an idea, and Siobhan went with it. So it's totally on her. Anyway, when she realized things were crumbling down around her, she decided to break down. I'm so mad. I shouldn't have listened to the teammates that were forcing me to do something that I should have known was wrong to do. Like, come on, as if crying is going to make anything better. But guess what? It wasn't just Siobhan. Autumn and Fran also pulled the same stunt by throwing Siobhan's help under the bus. Who poached this egg? I poached that oh, egg, Oh, Jesus. One point. Fuck off, will you? And that's even worse than what Siobhan did. Well, guess this challenge wasn't all that exciting after all, right? Uh, but guess what? This next contestant decided to take the easy way out and use canned sauce in the very first challenge of the competition. Yeah, believe me, I know how ridiculous that sounds, but it's true. During the first episode of season 14, while everyone was working hard to impress Ramsey with their culinary skills, Monique Booker took the quick and easy path. She was the last one from the red team to have her dish judged, and she presented what she called Moe's Pasta. Uh-huh. Naming a dish after yourself? Check. When Ramsay asked about her marinara sauce recipe, she confessed that she used a pre-made sauce from a jar. Having that name dish totally suck? Also check. And do I even have to tell you that Ramsay's reaction was priceless? It's just from a jar. He simply couldn't believe it. 
Ramsay wondered how she could be considered a chef if she couldn't even make her own sauce. However, Monique defended herself, arguing that using canned sauce was fine because not everyone has the time to make it from scratch, except maybe for a bunch of authentic Italians. I mean, forget being defensive. This one went full offense against Ramsay, and it's quite unbelievable that she had the audacity to do this too. No, if you wanted it, you should have just told me. I would have did it. You can't oh, do the kitchen. Tell you what I want. Arguing with Ramsay on the first challenge. Check, check, check it, eat, check. Look, I thought her attitude was terrible, and for a moment it looked like she would get the boot right then and there. However, surprisingly, Ramsay actually went ahead and said this. Most pasta, one out of five. Okay, got it. Given her attitude and lack of effort, it's understandable that one might have expected her to be kicked off the show even before setting foot in the kitchen. But somehow, she got lucky. But hey. The cans being in the pantry is an elaborate setup by the HK team to separate the great chefs from the lazy chefs. And I think Carrie fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. But I hope you're ready for season 9's signature dish challenge where chaos took center stage and the culinary rule breaking reached new heights. So, we had this dude Jonathan Plumley, who was like the king of breaking rules right from the get-go. Now, I won't lie, Jonathan wasn't exactly a culinary genius, but man, he definitely brought some levity to the show. That aside though, let's get into it. In this episode, it was Jennifer Normans versus our rule-breaking champ, Jonathan. Jennifer's dish was definitely looking like it came out of a three Michelin star kitchen, and Ramsay loved it. Well, you know what they say about following up those kinds of performances. Jonathan's punch drunk chicken was a hot mess to end all hot messes. And the fancy schmancy presentation? Honestly, at that point, it must have been insulting. What the f is that on a plate? Call this the uh, punch drunk chicken. But Ramsay? found out something crazy. Pineapple looks like can? Yes. Dude, use canned pineapples. Seriously, canned pineapples. And guess what? He had the nerve to blame the 45 minute time limit for that Hell's Kitchen faux pas, but Ramsey wasn't buying it. Not for a second. Limited time. 45 minutes? Ramsey totally roasted him, saying he was so full of crap that his eyes turned brown. In the end, Ramsay refused to taste it, calling it an absolute disaster. Can't blame him, right? Well, you also can't blame Jennifer for running away with the win either. Jonathan's canned pineapple fiasco certainly sealed his fate. I know it's too much for today, but the next contestant was a total disaster. Not only did they butcher the raw meat, but then they had the nerve to stick it back in the oven. You know how much Ramsay hates that, right? They were absolutely asking for trouble. So there's this contestant named Melissa Doney, who was a contestant on season eight and ranked in 10th place. She may as well have lit the entire service on fire, seeing how badly she ruined prom night dinner service. She sliced some meat, only to realize it was raw. Now, instead of accepting the mistake like a professional and, you know, maybe re-firing it, she thought she could salvage it by sticking it back in the oven. Can you imagine? Well, Ramsey sure can, and boy does he despise it. While Ramsey was giving Melissa a good scolding for that failure, another contestant named Nora Sively decided to chime in. Rule number one. This is Sorry, chef. Like, seriously, talk about bad timing. Ramsey was not having it and fired back at her for interrupting him. Whether or not she deserved it, I couldn't tell you, but hey, it's Ramsey's kitchen. Anyway, the next day, Ramsey thought maybe Melissa could do better in the blue kitchen, but unfortunately, she just kept getting worse. Tough break for Melissa, I guess. Now, some of these past moments we could chalk up as poor judgment, but this next moment couldn't have been more blatant. This next contestant thought she could cheat without anyone noticing her, but boy, it backfired big time. So, in the fifth episode of season five, we had Andrea Heinley on the meat station. Sneaky as she was, she hid some burnt Wellingtons and tried to act like she was fixing them when Ramsey asked about it. Where's the Wellington, please? Chef, I'm refiring a Wellington, the bottom's burning. Seriously, did she think that could fool Ramsey? Nah, our man saw right through her. 
And you can imagine the insane fallout from that situation. I'm yeah. putting protective uh, shut up, you, yeah? Shut up. What is this? Ramsey wasn't holding back, and he made sure the whole red team saw the mess of burnt meat. And did you see Andrea's face? Absolutely priceless. Instead of owning up to it, Andrea played it off with a lame excuse, saying she didn't know how it burned. Come on, we all know that she probably cranked up the heat way too high. And even if not, come on, you could see how bad it looked. Ramsey was not impressed to say the least. He gave her a dressing down of epic proportions. Hey, oh dear, fucking pile of shit. Man, it's moments like these that make me love reality TV. Now, you'd think Andrea would be history after that, right? But nope, she somehow managed to survive elimination. Gosh, that's an all too common occurrence. Like, most of the people on this list managed to escape the chopping block too. In her case, it was a close call and she admitted her performance was terrible. Yeah, no doubt. During the elimination talks, Andrea tried to be noble and told LA, the mastermind behind the nominations, that she wouldn't hold a grudge if she got picked. Well, how kind of her. Sure enough, Andrea ended up facing down the barrel of elimination, along with Jay Maxwell from the blue team, but like I said, she survived. Man, I'm seeing it, but I still can't believe it. Hell, she even walked out of there unfazed. But in this next episode, you'll see how these contestants tried to cheat and sabotage each other at the same time. Let's dive into the chaos of episode 3, season 12. Mike Aresta was working at the fish station with Chris, but hold on, because this is when things got wild. Mike straight up told Chris to drop the scallops when it wasn't time yet. And well, Chris was obviously pretty confused. No, not on this one. It's a fucking risotto. Now you confuse me. Was this part of Mike's devious plan to throw Chris under the bus for making a mistake? Well, it sure looks like it. And Chris, still confused as hell, called out Mike for acting like a complete idiot. Fast forward a bit, and Chris warned Mike about a super hot pan, but not before actually asking him to stay away from his station. You want me to watch these? No, no, no. I got you, Chris. He doesn't want any help. And this is when the real fun began. When Ramsey called out for the next dish, Mike brought this uncrusted halibut to the pass, something Chris had totally forgotten about. I'm behind you. Hey, 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 hey. Halibut. Although Chris tried to stop him, Mike was determined to have his way. And, well, his plan to sabotage Chris finally worked its magic. Where's the crust? I, I didn't get it. You get it all, man! Yes, chef. But Mike wasn't done yet. He walked up with another halibut, and this time, he had his eyes on DeMarco. You see, DeMarco had forgotten to leave the bone in his chicken, which meant it needed a refire. I'm not sending one more fucking table out unless it's complete. Ramsey couldn't understand why the team's cooperation was going so poorly. Despite the warning, Scott ran out of patience and walked his lamb to the pass, not wanting to wait for the halibut. <clears throat> and that was the end of it. That one mistake got the entire blue team kicked out of the kitchen. Fuck up out of there. Get out. It was like everyone was trying to cheat to get ahead and send their dish out to the pass before anyone else had a chance to. There was no communication, no teamwork whatsoever, just full-blown aggro and sabotage. But that's nothing compared to the hard lessons that Jeremy Madden had to learn during his time in the kitchen. Remember when Jeremy's infamous lack of communication made Ramsey completely lose his mind? Jeremy, hey, hey, he's not even answering me. Come on, Jeremy. Can I get an answer from you? First off, the guy couldn't even hear the order. And when Ramsey confronted him about it, Jeremy straight up admitted he had no clue. I mean, seriously, the balls the guy must have had to just brush Ramsey off like that. But that wasn't the only time. Remember the croissant debacle? Jeremy decided to stand there like a statue, doing absolutely nothing. It was like he had a full-blown factory reset. Just look at him in action. Or, well, more aptly, in action. Jeremy, in the middle of the air like that with breakfast. Jeremy, walk. Come around then, big boy. Ramsey was probably just as puzzled as I was when I saw this for the first time. And still am, watching it all over again. Minutes later, Jeremy finally brought up the croissant to the pass. But wait, looks like something's missing. So where's the smoked salmon scrambled eggs? Get smoked over there salmon. and help play the smoked salmon. Oh, right, the smoked salmon. You know, like half the dish. After his grand standstill performance, Jeremy suddenly got a second wind and tried to finish up everything at once. Come on! 
Oh, watch your back, watch your back. Come on, come down. And then came the moment of truth. All the plates were lined up for the pass. And guess what caught Ramsey's eye? You guessed it. Jeremy's plate. And this wasn't just any plate. It was a freaking sample. Some disgusting pig brought me the sample scrambled eggs that I cooked an hour ago. Can you believe the level of stupidity going on here? Well, Ramsey sure didn't, since he was in utter disbelief and proceeded to give Jeremy a piece of his mind. Yes, they save lives on a daily basis, and you want to serve that. You fucking kill someone with that! Well, considering the dude may as well have been sleeping, he definitely needed the wake-up call. But in the eighth episode of season 10, a contestant made a dirty move. And I mean that in the most literal sense of the word. The restaurant had some notable guests that night, including Tito Ortiz, who was served by the blue team, and Sugar Ray Leonard, who unfortunately had to endure Christina's undercooked risotto. Ramsey must have been far from pleased with these mishaps. Furthermore, Tiffany Johnson shocked everyone by attempting something truly revolting. How long? Tiffany. Unbelievable. Can you imagine she actually placed a knife to her lips before inserting it into the Wellingtons? Disgusting. Ramsey not only caught her in the act, but also publicly reprimanded her for it. And her response? A mere half-hearted, yes, chef. No remorse, no disgust, no guilt of any kind at all. How charming. Furthermore, she completely brushed off Barbie Marshall when she attempted to communicate with her during the service. It ain't hard to see that she showed no interest in addressing the issue or even acknowledging her actions. You have it? Yes, Barbie. Okay. Hey, Barbie, just like move off of my station because I don't need help. To top it all off, she sent her Wellingtons to the pass without even properly wrapping the pastry. It was so bad that Ramsey had to intervene and prevent Barbie from putting them in the oven. That's when Tiffany completely lost control and had a full-blown meltdown. Handling criticism was definitely not her strong suit. But oh, can you no. please organize it, Tiffany? No, not an organize. She's picking up this already cooked. I don't know what she's doing. Uh, if I had a buck for every person that I've said couldn't handle criticism on this show, boy, I'd be a rich man. Given her stellar behavior, it came as no surprise that Tiffany's stay in Hell's Kitchen was short-lived. She was eliminated from the competition for displaying a poor attitude, showing absolutely no passion for cooking, and overall, just being a complete disappointment. But this next chef who served up trash can pasta surprisingly managed to finish in third place. In season three, we were introduced to Jen Yamola, who had a bit of a rocky start. During dinner service in the third episode, Jen was at the meat station. After Joanna Dunn's disastrous crab incident, Ramsey moved Jen and Julia Williams to the appetizer station to help the struggling red team. It took the team a long time to get their first set of appetizers out, but eventually, thanks to Jen and Julia, they got it done. However, while sending out the appetizers, Jen ended up cooking way too much spaghetti. Like, way, way too much. Not knowing what to do with the excess, she came up with the brilliant idea to throw it in the trash. But guess what? Just as she finished tossing it, Ramsey called for the next ticket. And I swear, you couldn't make this next part up. That ticket? Let me just get it. I'll get it. I'll get it. We had an order for spaghetti, and I threw out what we had. Well, it called for spaghetti. Because, of course, it did. Jen freaked out. Damn, she had just wasted a whole batch of the stuff the second before she actually needed it. But Jen had another, shall we say, brilliant idea. When I decided to retrieve the spaghetti from the top of the garbage and washed it. Yeah, no. How is it even okay to pick the whole bunch of spaghetti back out of the garbage to use it in her next dish? I mean, seriously, disgusting doesn't do justice to how awful it was. Meanwhile, Julia couldn't believe her eyes. Still, she called Jen out on it. Where'd you get it from? Garbage on top? Oh, no, 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 no way. The only reason Jen escaped that night was because this little incident slipped through the cracks and Ramsey didn't get wind of it. Jeez, talk about dodging a bullet. Despite the pasta incident, Jen managed to learn from her mistakes and redeem herself, eventually making it to the top three. But her top three finish isn't why most people remember her. Nope. 
It was, and will always be, that trash can pasta. After Hell's Kitchen, Jen spoke to the New York Post and claimed that the show was rigged. She said the production team made her take the pasta from the trash can and that she was upset about it. She tried to discuss it with them, but they didn't listen. However, a fan of the show pointed out that Jen's claim of the show ruining her career is laughable, given that she, as a chef, was seen serving food from the trash on camera. Like, what would they possibly be able to do to you if you, you know, refused? So, what do you think? Is the show really rigged, or was Jen just trying to protect herself? Let me know what you have to say in the comments below. But if we're talking cheaters, I've gotta bring up this episode from season four, which was a total comedy of errors. With miscommunications left, right, and center, both teams were totally bombing the dinner service. Two hours later, it seems like neither of them were winning. So Ramsey pulled out the comment cards to pick a winner. And surprise, surprise, the blue team won because they actually managed to serve half their entrees and did slightly better than the red team too, I guess. That certainly helped. But here's where it gets interesting. Corey Erling got named the best of the worst, and that meant she had to nominate two people from her team for elimination. Now, the rule book says you gotta nominate the weakest chefs from that service, but Corey thought she could game the system in her favor. So she decided to try and get rid of the ones she didn't like, letting her personal feelings mess with the spirit of the competition. Back in the dorms, instead of nominating Sharon like everyone expected, Corey was cooking up a sneaky plan. But oh boy, her teammates saw right through her. They knew Corey's game and they weren't playing along. No one bothered to come and plead their case to her and honestly, it wouldn't have made a difference anyway. But Corey had a different take on the matter. No one has come up to me and had the balls to fucking try to convince me to keep him here. When the moment came to name the nominees, Corey went for Christina as her first pick for strategic reasons. She might want to take a deeper look and actually look inside me, past my appearances, and examine what I have inside of me. And Jen as her second, just because she didn't like her. Talk about mixing emotions and competition. Now, Ramsey was a little surprised by the nominations, but he still called both of them down. But nobody was ready for this twist. Sharon. He eliminated Sharon instead of either one of the nominees Corey picked. Boom! Corey's plan blew up in her face. And Ramsey isn't one to forgive a slight like that. This scheme sealed her fate right then and there. Some viewers on YouTube even said that Ramsey wants smart players, but these contestants just end up trying his patience by being too clever for their own good. Ramsey didn't need to say a word directly to Corey, but I'd be surprised if she didn't receive the message loud and clear. But I have a conscience, and in good conscience, I could not keep Sharon. Don't mess with the boss. Another viewer mentioned that Corey made an absolutely scummy decision here by abusing the system like that. Luckily, Ramsey straightened the situation out and gave the boot to the person who actually deserved it. Yeah, you said it, Julie. Gal was definitely being a dirtbag here. But here comes a contestant from Pennsylvania who thought it was a brilliant idea to dip his finger into the food. My feelings about it can be summed up in one word. Repulsive. The first episode always revolves around making a lasting impression by showcasing impressive culinary skills. However, this individual, while attempting to make risotto, couldn't stop boasting about his vast and storied experience. Sadly for him, he couldn't walk the talk he was throwing down. Soup, like liquid. It's so runny, you can't even spot the rice in there. The whole kitchen was a hot mess. Chaos from all sides. This guy named Gaurav Naveen who thought he was the risotto expert, tried to fix it, but ended up making it way too peppery. And instead of owning up to it, he had the nerve to try and defend himself. It's a like, risotto, not a vindaloo. Yes, yeah, chef. I love black pepper in my risotto. Like, seriously, dude, the dish is for the customers, not for you. Everything was falling apart for both teams, and Ramsey was losing his patience. But hold up. Our risotto king had another trick up his sleeve. We do not stick our fingers in the food. Flick it, and then go back inside. Can you believe it? He really did that. Ramsey was disgusted. He tore into the entire team, asking if they had any respect for the customers. And to top it off, the guy got caught on camera licking his tongue while getting an earful from Ramsey. Ugh, dude's got absolutely zero shame. 
And what's more disgusting is, he thought it was fine. A fan said that what she hated about Guarov was that he honestly didn't see anything wrong with licking his fingers and putting it in food someone else is gonna eat. And if this is how he acts on camera, imagine how he is behind closed doors. Ugh. Another fan said Guarov didn't seem to understand the basics of hospitality and catering hygiene. Like, HK ain't Culinary 101, with countless failures, overcooked lobster, and scallop disasters, Ramsey had enough and kicked the whole blue team out of the kitchen. Well, better luck next time, I guess. During the deliberation that night, our risotto prodigy was in the hot seat. And what did he have to say for himself? He had the audacity to claim that he had all the passion, attitude, and talent to stay in the competition. You can probably guess how Ramsey took that. You forgot fingers. Yeah, that was the end of Navian's time in Hell's Kitchen. Good riddance. Now, these aren't even half the cheaters who have graced the Hell's Kitchen set. If I missed your favorite dubious contestant, don't forget to sound off in the comments and join me in my channel's Discord server. We can continue this discussion and more there for free. And for those of you who want a little extra, I've got an exclusive server just for you. Well, I'm excited to see you there, but before you leave, make sure to hit that like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. Also, don't forget to check out my latest video right here. It's even crazier.